would say, judging by the students that I had the pleasure of talking to at lunch, the industry is in good hands, but I don't think we're feeding our folks very well, because these ladies over here told me that they eat cat food every lunch, so they were pleased for the free lunch, and I'm glad to hear that. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is not so much about the technology that you see, but sort of the research that we're doing and I was fascinated by the gentleman that was looking at behavior because I think behavior has a lot of impact on any technology that we develop and also on the environment. So uh, who we are is, as we said, is we have developed a data acquisition platform and on it we're building a number of products for livestock. You've seen one of our products today, the feed intake system. We also are developing products for feedlot, we're in dairy, and we're also in proof of concept for a cow-calf product and also one for sheep. We've tested goats, but I never want to do that again. That's not, that's not the species we want to be in. But what we've done is today you were all out picking the most efficient animal and you saw our technology out in the field. And really what that technology does is there's uh, an RFID antenna built in the rim of the trough. The trough is suspended on load cells that measure to a 10 gram resolution. So we're measuring very, very finitely. And we're collecting data every second. Now all of our systems around the world are connected to us remotely over the internet. So we're actually looking at your data daily. And the gentleman that does that, or one of the gentlemen that does that for us, Kevin Garasino is here today, and if you have an interest in looking at the type of data we collect, and if perhaps you know which animals tag you had, we can actually show you some of the data on the animals that are in the pen. So that system that you see was our first system, and one of the things that was talked about today was behavior, and I wanted to show you a little bit about the behavior data that we do collect. What you're looking at here is you're looking at feed disappearance from one trough. So if you take a look, you see the black line is the feed that we're measuring in the trough. And the colored dots that you see are one second of measurement, and each color represents a different animal. So if I had a cursor on that system, I could tell you which RFID tag was feeding. If you take a look at this data, you see something very quickly. You see that each animal has almost an individual feeding signature. And we can see that more closely here. And we've learned that if we have two weeks of data with an RFID tag attached, if we take two weeks of blank data, we can match those directly up to each other. So we found that animals have an individual, almost like a fingerprint, a digital feeding signature. And there's a lot in that data. If you take a look at this description, you see that this yellow animal is sort of deking in between another animal. You see that that blue animal is really forcing a lot of pressure on the weigh scale. And that animal is probably showing some aggressive traits. Don't know what it means yet, but that's something that science needs to take a look at. We're also analyzing the feeding rates in those feeding behaviors. We see a very quick, if you wish, or a very fast feeding rate when the feed truck first comes. But we do see that individual animals are eating differently, like John referred to. And there is a relationship to uh, feed efficiency in some of these animals. So once we start looking at feeding behavior, I think we'll also see things about aggressiveness, adaptation to perhaps certain rations, adaptation to certain management practices. So there's a lot in this data that we haven't looked at yet. All of that data is preserved. You may not be interested in, in it today, but someday if we find things, we can go back and reinvestigate this data again. So everything you've, you've collected at the Hereford Association, that will be preserved. And in the future, there may be much more that we can mine within this data. So there's some fun days ahead. Or I guess if you're a nerd, there's some fun days ahead. Uh, what we are doing, and uh, it was very nice of Olds College to invite us here today. They did so because we won an award this year, and we kind of laugh that we're an overnight success after 23 years of research and development. That's what it kind of feels like to our company. But what we've done is we've started looking at feedlots, and this is where it gets very interesting in the type of data that we collect. 
And what you're looking at is a measurement unit that sits around a water trough. And what we're collecting from this unit is we're collecting when an animal comes to drink, we're collecting a mass of data, wind speed, temperature, humidity. We're also measuring animals as they come up to the trough. So we're collecting the RFID and data from multiple environmental and biometric sensors to build great data sets. And what we're looking at is the same kind of technology platform that you saw in the feed intake system. Again, all of our systems around the world are connected to us over the internet, and we're in constant touch with these systems. When an animal steps up to drink, he steps on a small platform. And this isn't a traditional platform, it's suspended in the, in the top of the unit. The reason for that, especially in these conditions, we would have load cells that would bind with manure and mud and they would freeze. So we have to come up with a new mechanism. We're only measuring the partial body weight. So we're only measuring just the front feet of that animal as he comes to drink. And it was here in Olds College that we actually learned we could do that. And the reason we can do this is that we built a factor for every individual animal that comes on our system and we can convert to a uh, full body weight. Got to tell you though, we're not really interested in live weight, we're interested in hot carcass weight. And one of the things that we found, and on almost every breed type, is that partial body weight is almost equal, that raw weight we collect is almost equal to hot carcass weight. So for us, pay weight is of the most interest. We're also accurately measuring daily gain, and daily gain is something that you can't see. You can maybe see a, a gross weight, and there's some producers that are just real good at that, but you can't see how much an animal is gaining every day. We're also measuring the individual animal water intake, intake from sinks that we've installed in a specialized water trough. And what we do is we collect a whole bunch of data from the feed yard system. We're looking at their feed cost, the feed supply to the bunks, we're looking at their medication costs, uh, what type of people are treating, we're looking at everything we can collect. We collect that automatically from the feed yard databases, and each day we report a daily weight and growth statistics for the animal that we're measuring. We're accurately forecasting future feed intake weight, and we're digitally profiling the health of each and every animal, and we've learned that behavioral signals that we see, reduction in water intake, reduction in weight, changes in frequency and duration at the, at the water trough, we're able to look at an animal becoming ill about four days in advance of visual symptom expression, so that's very early in the disease cycle. We're also looking to determine the optimal market time when the cost of gain begins to exceed the value of gain. And that's a very important point, especially when you're selecting animals. Today, on progeny, we kind of finish cattle all at one time. But they may not be the optimal animals. We, they, we may not be marketing them well. So this is something that we've looked at. And we've also learned that the more data we collect, the more we learn. And i got to tell you what we also find all the time is all the things that we think we know, we don't know. As we start to collect more data, we learn more. So that's, that's really a fascinating thing about our system. Now, we learned something very early on. Every wire we put in the air will be taken down by a front-end loader. Every wire that we will put underground will be dug up. We've also learned that everything about the feedlot and the cattle industry requires robust and reliable technology. And when we did some of our first testing in cactus feeders, they said to us, it is really great that you can tell us which animal is sick or which animal we should market, but how are we going to find them? Because in a feed yard pen of 350 animals, not many cowboys can run in and find the RFID tag. So they said to us, you need a way of visually identifying animals for us. So we tried a few things, some really crazy things. And we thought we knew everything about things that we could do in technology, but we learned the hardest thing. First off, to find a color that would color every hide if we wanted to spray paint cattle was really tough. We also found out that if you started to try to spray cattle in the pen, that if you sprayed in 50 mile an hour winds, you'd be spraying the cattle four pens down. 
So we had to build a lot of technology to enable just visual identification of animals. We had to collect data in real time, analyze it in real time, send a trigger back to the unit so that we could spray paint cattle. We had to have the ability to adjust the velocity of the spray paint that we were sending down if we were in windy conditions. This was a whack of technology that we had to build just to spray paint cattle. But it really was the thing that we had to do to be able to use our systems practically in a feedlot environment. Now, when we had that whole bunch of technology, we also realized we had the base technology to individually treat animals in the pen without human intervention. And so that's the stage of our research today. We're looking at products that can be delivered in the feed yard based on our digital profiles of sickness. And this is where we're at today on automation. So what we've developed for the feedlot is a system that can automatically track animals, determine when animals are becoming ill, treat them without human intervention, and really improve the profitability in the feed yard. Today, this technology, and you have to have about 10 pence of cattle, this technology costs $12 per animal through a feed yard stay, and we're returning about $60 per animal in the feed yard based on this technology. Now I wanted to show you a little bit about how we identify sickness. This is something that people don't really understand. You know, how are you doing this? And we actually do it on the bulls that are out there. If, if we see a change in feed intake, we see a change, we'll notify the old college folks that something's going on with cattle. But what you're looking at, and you don't have to really look at the graph per se, but in our graphs, this is the performance of one animal in the feed yard. And so the gray bar that you see is one day of feed intake data. The little blue dots you see is one day of water intake for that animal. The red line is the growth curve that we've measured. And that red dot you see is an animal who died in the pen. So in some of our studies, we blind the cowboys from our systems and we let things happen as they usually would. In this case, what you see is you see that the animal's feeding behavior, you see his water intake changed dramatically for many days before, the, before he was found dead in the pen. So something's going on before we identify animals. I'll show you a, a few others. This animal died in the pen of bloat. We all think that bloat happens very rapidly, but if you take a look, you see that about 10 days earlier, that animal started changing his behavior and he actually stopped eating and he stopped drinking. That's 10 days on feed that he was on before anyone noticed that he was sick and until he died in the pen. Again, here's an animal with pneumonia. He was actually picked up at about uh, 16 days before he actually died in the pen. He was treated three times and you know what the cost of the treatment is. But in reality, the system, or at least the changes in water intake and, 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 and feed intake were such that we, picked, we could have picked them up about 24 days in advance. Now, I'm not saying that every animal we identify can we do something with, but that's where our research is looking at now. Can we early identify cattle? Can we respond quickly to them? That's uh, one of our focus. Another point that was really brought up here today is how do we measure intake on pasture? And this is something that we have been going after. How possibly could we do this? We have signed a master research agreement with the Noble Foundation out of Argor, Oklahoma to start investigating pasture, uh, monitoring and measurement on pasture. And what we've done is you see this uh, sort of a pasture layout here. We've We've installed on eight small grain pastures those feed intake or those water monitoring units that you saw. We've installed them around a confined watering source and we started our research in February and we are amazed by what we're seeing. We're seeing that the animal response that we measure, so the gain on, on pasture, the water intake on pasture, is telling us as much about the pasture as it is about the animal itself. So now we're starting to try to build models that will integrate the data from the pastures, so the growth and things that we're measuring in soils, environment, with the animal response to see what kind of technology makes sense in terms of ranch analytics. So 
why we won this award, and it's really rare for the IT community to, uh, to ever get into agriculture. And so for us, this was pretty cool. Intel saw the way that we were handling data. And you've, I've told you that we collect data every second of the day. It's a massive amount of data from one small feedlot that has 84, about 84 of those units that you saw, those feed intake units. They also have 36 pens of our Grow Safe beef equipment. And we're monitoring about 5,400 animals at one time. The data sets that this feed yard collects are about 70 million data points per day, which we st distill down to 5 gigabytes of data per day. Your standard access database can only handle two gigabytes. So every day, we could be filling up computers everywhere, but we've developed a process whereby we can keep data very small in a locked format, and we've created a data corridor where there's data running over the internet constantly, and through that process, Intel thought, wow, this is really cool. This is what's happening in farms and ranches everywhere. I said, not quite everywhere. But uh, we are getting to the point in agriculture where computers are so incredibly important. William referred to that today. And most of these students here have social media sites and they have computer skills that we haven't seen in the industry before. And I think that's highly exciting. So, why are we at Olds College and why am I so excited to be here? Because i got to tell you that it all started here. In 2001, we installed really our first commercial system here. And we had two systems before, one with John Bassar at the Home Research Center that had all sorts of different things, stanchions and other things that we tried on it, and at Lethbridge Research Center. And then we developed the system that we installed at Olds. And that's pretty cool that your first really, your really good research system occurred at a college level. So I think that's highly exciting. We installed our first system that looked like that. We installed our first weight platform that looked like that. And we worked from this big platform down to a small platform. And working with the college was just incredible probably because of the people who helped us with that. And Neil French was very much a driver in that, Connie Burton, and some of the staff here were just incredible for us and enabled us a testing ground that we couldn't have had elsewhere. Also, the first really good research, industry-involved research occurred here as well. And I like to put it that this was a collaboration that I've not seen um, I've seen it since, and your, and your project is one of the examples of it, but a combination of University of Alberta, Lethbridge Research Center, Lacombe Research Center, and really there was so much inspiration in setting up this project. The researchers that were involved, and I've highlighted a few in bold because they were very, very active and involved, but it was researchers, it was producers, and it was exciting. It was just a really, really great project. And I think that was the foundation of why we were able to grow around the world. And producers from all around the world came to Olds to see the kind of things that we've been doing. Now, where we are today from that early start is we now have more than 100 installations around the world. About half of them are academic. And what's really interesting is that our largest growth is on producer farms. Our smallest farm that uses our technology, the feed intake technology, is only a 200 mother cow farm. So when you're talking about how do we afford all these things, it's interesting. The people that are really going ahead and figuring it out and learning how to market their cattle, they're the ones that are getting that edge. If you consider that we started this back in 2001 and the first stuff started here, we should be miles down the road today. So that's kind of something that maybe we should investigate. Why homegrown stuff just goes everywhere and then takes so long at home to, to leap off. But we're now all around the world, as I said. Uh, Brazil has become our largest growth market. I would say in the last two years, we've established 11 private stations. That's huge. That's huge. And one of the statistics that we're most proud of is that 
and I've kind of lost track of these statistics, but there's at least 350 publications specifically about residual feed intake using our GrowSafe technology. More proud I am in the students who have got their PhD, master's, undergrad, using data from our systems and using our system. And there's actually a few of them in this room today. William Torres working with Dr. Karstens, then went on to a really phenomenal position at Cattleland, and he has an extensive bio because he works harder than the rest of us. So that, that's why he has that big bio. But really, that's what we're most proud of. The, the number of producers we've touched, the number of producers we've, uh, producers we've touched, the number of students we've touched, and I really thank you for today because it was uh, so neat to come home. Very nice. And if you have any questions, be delighted to answer them, but you can also uh, chat with, with uh, Kevin if you want to take a look at your data. Can you upload our RFID, our RFID tag? Can you upload them off of the satellite? Uh, you can. So I got to call and run the password. Yeah, you can. Um, but satellite time is very expensive. So satellite time, you pay by the bit. So what you want to do is you want to have a data acquisition hub, and then you want to collect that data from there. So that's how we're doing it. If you're just sending small bytes, it's only a few cents. But you've got to really play with data compression. How expensive? It can, it can run you expensive. So when you're talking about tags, there's no value in RFID tags beyond just uh, an electric, electronic name tag. So if I was ever going to create a satellite system, I'd want to know what other data do I want to transmit along with that RFID data to make it make sense. Okay? Are you talking dispositional data? Well, yes, as well. Can you umbrella, can you umbrella an area with a... Uh, yes. i got to be careful what I'm saying here for other reasons, but okay. <laughs> can you... Uh, if I had a quarter section, could I umbrella it and then just pick off? Not with the RFID, not with the RFID tag alone. RFID tags work with antennas and they have limitations. Oh, yeah, that's stuff but that's you can do it. You can do it and there's a lot of people that are doing it by building funnels where your cattle flow through a funnel. And the GPS tags right now, and there are sensors that are being looked at. But you got to say, what do I need? What data do I want from that system before you start developing around it? So, do I want to know what pasture they're on? Do I want to know what's happening on that pasture? There's all sorts Why of things. Do do and boy, with that, we have to talk. Right. Yeah, you can do certain things with it. Because some of the other stuff I'm involved in, like that's laser. There's only one over there, but it's. Uh... Yeah, there's lots, of, there's lots of possibilities. The idea is to get the least expensive way of monitoring and the most stuff you want to monitor. Yes? Looking at your uh, feeding pattern, the bite pressure, the spikes are obviously self-explanatory. I was wondering if you could explain the dips that mm -hmm. were present there. The dips are often from the pressure that was put on was so significant pushes it down into an overload situation sometimes, and also you're seeing that depth. So that's, that's a very aggressive feeder where you see that. You're also seeing, we're measuring below the baseline or below the noise floor, so we sometimes have measurements that drop below. When an animal does that, would that not identify the fact that they're predator freer? And they're, well, how long does it take the, to take that bite and get away from there? Are they doing it because of fear factor? Or are they, doing it because they're aggressively hungry. As you see, that's a good question. And you know, those, some of those things we just don't know. But that animal that you saw that was putting that pressure on, he wasn't moving, he was there. Yeah. So he was putting that, that pressure on while he was there. So once he loaded up in his mouth, did he back away from it or did he stay there? Not in that example that I showed you, but there's all sorts of examples. That's one of the toughest it's things. There's what is in the pipeline for future monitoring? I would say that one of the most exciting things, if you've ever looked at a vitamin water, uh, this is what I found really interesting. Like we could, uh, we don't have any label products 
that can be distributed through water using our methodology. There's not one. So we're looking right now at nutraceuticals, pharmaceutical, like non-label pharmaceutical type products that we can deliver through the water. If you look at a vitamin water that Coke sells for maybe $4, they used a new process. Um, it's a nano-based process where they could deliver very small amounts of minerals and things that weren't typically water soluble. So I think that we're going to see developments in nano type application products, biomarkers, which you're working on, hugely interesting. I see genomics a little bit differently than the folks at Livestock Gentech. I see that genomics are, are going to be the way we do a few different things to manage certain populations of cattle. Perhaps not the way they see it, but I see that combined with technologies like ours, genomics could be an incredible forward process. I'm not thinking so much about selection as perhaps management. I also think that we see new biosensors. And I'm really excited about that. Sensor world is really tough because of power consumption. Everything we have consumes power. So as we have new solar sources and we have new things, the price of this stuff comes down. And this gentleman mentioned unmanned aircraft. Cool, really cool, the things that we can be doing. So I think farming's going to look way different in the next 20 or 40 years. Military Absolutely. <laughs> Yes. Do you ever see the day that we can do fertility evaluations similar to the dairy industry where they're doing uh, hormones in, in, in line with milk production or, or some other evaluation that you have technology like you guys can provide in range? I think, I think that the, we're only limited by our imagination. And definitely, of course, money has, has an overlie on that. But, it's, it's incredible as we explore these areas, you know, the producers that are here today, we heard behavior, really cool. You know, we've heard unmanned aircraft. Um, these aren't the youngest guys in the room that are saying this. So when we start hearing, no offense, but when we start hearing these kind of things, I think that we can just kind of <laughs> I, I think that we, we just don't know what the future is going to bring. So I, I think it's really cool, but I hope I can live a lot longer because I've been at this a long time. So I'm excited to see where we go next. Thank you.